No doubt more comfortable for you. So welcome back for, from lunch, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the director and a convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. For those who know us, we often call ourselves AILA. Um, and it's my great privilege today to have been invited to be uh, a moderator or MC for your afternoon. So if you have any um, interesting questions, please ask me. If they're complicated or logistical, perhaps ask someone in a white shirt. So before opening up into the next session, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and my organisation and also um, just want to do some thank yous as well. So the Australian Earth Laws Alliance is a group of renegade lawyers who formed about four years ago um, after deep concern about what environmental law wasn't doing to support the earth. Many of those folks are actually inspired by the wonders of deep ecology and particularly the work of Thomas Berry. We are now engaged in a really interesting range of multidisciplinary projects aimed at supporting the creation of earth-centred law, governance and ethics. We dabble in everything from hardcore law to the much more enjoyable earth arts the Rights of Nature Tribunal for Citizens later this year, and a range of other projects in between. And the one reason I mention it is we've just started a project called Green Prints, which is all about how lawyers and planners and governance nerds who love all that stuff can play a part in supporting the transition towards um, life after fossil fuels. Right now we're entrenched in a battle to, to handle the issues of climate change, to, to grapple with mitigation, to manage ongoing adaptation. But once we have phased out of the industries that have helped cause the problem, what happens next? Green Prints is actually all about designing really cool ways to live within ecological limits, to create new economic opportunities, and we're working with a multivarious form of humans all across Australia. And the reason I mention it is any communities who are interested in these kind of projects, please come and see me later. And any experts in anything, please come and have a yarn, because we're really going to connect with lots of people over the coming year. In terms of speaking about climate change, it's been wonderful this morning to hear the speakers speak in such a, a positive way about all of the different initiatives, everything from divestment to the kinds of work that needs to be done in um, planning our cities and all the other things we're going to talk about shortly. I guess I just wanted to mention that I first met Mara Bunn when I started to work for the first agency set up for climate change in 1996 in Sydney called the Sustainable Energy Development Authority. And what's profound about that is, as a young person back in those days, um, we only worked on climate mitigation. There was no such concept as adaptation. So the, the things have changed over the last couple of decades. It's worth remembering how far we've deteriorated our earth, but how much um, work we have to do and have already done. So it's great today that everything is so positive. And I really value um, what Gecko have done to put together this workshop, or this conference for the two days, and just wanted to say a big thank you from someone who's attending and enjoying. So three cheers for Gecko. And I do want to just make a big plug, as I will now, and at the end of my sessions of talking to you about supporting the Friends of Gecko project, so, uh, program. So if you haven't already become a monthly donor, please do. There's a phenomenal amount of work that has to be done in the Gold Coast region. So please support Gecko. They do great things and phenomenal work for um, predominantly a volunteer organisation. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Jim Reeves, the Director General of the Department of Environment and Heritage in Queensland. Um, Jim's going to speak about government policies in respect of climate change. His previous roles include the Director of Operations for the Institute for Future Environments and was the manager of Brisbane Water. So if um, we've got time for Jim to speak and we'll have a few minutes afterwards for some questions. So please welcome Jim. Thanks a lot and good afternoon. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the Coomba Mary people and uh, Uncle Graham Dillon if he's here, uh, Mara Bunn, the facilitator, and Graham Dillon, um, oh, sorry, uh, and Professor Martin Betts. Is, if Martin's here, I work with him at QUT, so I was looking forward to seeing Martin, but he might be elsewhere this afternoon. I understand you ha um, had the minister here this morning, my minister, uh, Minister Miles. He is a um, fantastic minister to work, work to and with, um, very, very, passionate about the area and uh, he says he's here for a, um, he's, he wants to put all his energy into this sort of portfolio. He's a very, very exciting person to work for. Um, 
So thanks for the opportunity uh, to come and speak to you here today. And I hope I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what the minister, we didn't compare notes, but um, if there's any sort of overlap, uh, please uh, bear with me. Uh, but the Queensland government's very serious about uh, addressing climate change and was elected in 2015 with a mandate to revitalise the climate change agenda. I uh, came back to the department with the uh, election of the, of the current government. Um, I left with the election of the former government be, um, uh, because I, I, I had worked with um, the then Premier uh, uh, when I was at Brisbane Water and I didn't think that it was a relationship I wanted to sort of uh, invest in again. Um, but I didn't expect to be back so quickly. Uh, but we've hit, we've hit the ground running um, uh, to respond, adapt and capitalise on opportunities to tackle climate change. The policies and strategies we're developing are both innovative and evolving. Already we've made a number of commitments signalling revitalisation of the state's climate change agenda, emphasising both adaptation climate change impacts and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The 2016-17 budget uh, announced in mid-June includes a, a commitment of a further $6.8 million over four years to better understand how climate change will affect Queensland and to help get us climate ready. The Queensland Government has invested $3 million over three years to develop and implement Queensland Climate Change Adaptation Strategy, QCAS is the acronym, to ensure the state, its people, environment and economy are best positioned to adapt to current and future climate impacts. A public consultation paper inviting Queenslanders to contribute ideas about priorities and best practice approaches to adaptation will be released in the coming months. QCAS is being developed in partnership with a wide range of peak bodies from relevant sectors in Queensland who are vulnerable to climate change, beginning with the primary industry sector and local government through to, through to the, uh, and we'll be involving the LGAQ. Um, last month, Minister Miles announced the $12 million Q Coast 2100 program to help coastal councils address current and future coastal ha hazards. I was talking to Mara Bunn before. Again, last time I was at the department, we spent a year and a half working on a, a coastal plan um, and it was one of the first things that was sort of, uh, you know, uh, dismantled with the former government. So it's back to the future. Um, so it is to help coastal councils address current and future coastal hazards. Uh, ca councils can apply for grant funding to prepare plans and strategies to deal with the effects of sea level rise. We're now aware of how vulnerable coastal communities are becoming to only a small amount of rising sea level. Sea level rise of 0.8 metres will have the potential to affect many at risk areas here on the Gold Coast. The Queensland Government's also reinstating world class coastal planning laws. Planning decisions should reflect sea level rise projections. The Queensland Government wants to ensure people have the right direction and advice when making long term decisions. However, we won't leave local governments to manage this risk on their own. We will, uh, our department will support them to better consider current and future coastal hazards. The government is ready to respond, adapt and capitalise on opportunities to tackle climate change. Doing so is critical to prepare Queensland for the future, to manage the transition to a low carbon world and make <coughs> sure pardon me, that our fair share of the jobs and industries of the future are built in our state. On 11 May, Minister Miles released Advancing Climate Action Queensland, making the transition to a low carbon future discussion paper, outlining opportunities available to tackle climate change and reduce our emissions, highlighting what we're already doing and seeking input from the community about what more we can do. The consultation period closed on, closes on 5th of August, and if you haven't already, I urge you to take a look at the discussion paper and have your say. A clean energy future. With advances in technology and global trends driving increased innovation and investment, we're taking action to put Queensland firmly on the path to a clean energy future. Developing and expanding Queensland's renewable energy industry is a central component of the transition uh, and the state government's energy policy agenda. 
We're committed to increasing the uptake of renewable energy to create jobs of the future, continue to boost investment and act on climate change. Queensland has some of the best solar resources in the world and is ideally placed to benefit as solar generation becomes an, increasing, an increasingly part, important part of Australia's electricity generation mix. Queensland already is a world leader in the uptake. There are currently more than 450,000 rooftops across the state generating solar PV electricity and over the next six years we aim to increase that to one million rooftops. Not only do we lead Australia in household solar PV and Queensland uh, is also one of the cheapest places in the world to install large scale power generation. To capitalise on this, the Queensland Government is working with a number of private sector organisations who have expressed an interest in large scale renewable projects, including solar, wind and biomass. The Government has partnered with ARENA, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, to secure 120 megawatts of large scale solar projects, while Ergon Energy has announced a power purchase agreement for the development of a 170 megawatt Mount Emerald wind farm in far north Queensland. The government's also working with proponents of a further 17 projects spread across the state, offering an additional 1,000 megawatts of installed energy generation valued at $2.4 billion and offering up to 2,300 jobs during construction. The private sector has shown an appetite in developing large scale renewable projects, especially now that we have opened the door to new investment and employment in regional Queensland. In the past, Queensland's renewable energy target liability was mostly met through the spot market. This meant that rather than supporting home ground so solar and wind projects, we've been supporting renewable energy in other states. Queensland has, a good renewable has good renewable resources and is working to harness them. The construction and operation of these large scale renewable energy plants will also encourage local and international investment, create jobs and help our economy transition to a low carbon future. The naysayers might be saying that renewables such as solar are too expensive and not enough of us are uh, supporting it to make it work. But forecasters and naysayers have been wrong before. Take for example the mobile phone industry. In 1980 AT&T commissioned a study to forecast mobile phone use by the year 2000 in the United States. They projected 900,000 users. The actual figure was 109 million, 120 times higher. So we won't be disheartened. We have excellent uh, renewable energy resources and it's a fast growing energy with major growth potential and significant environmental benefits. <coughs> to help cap catalyse further investment, the Queensland Government has assembled a formidable team of business, energy and environmental experts that are currently leading a public inquiry into establishing a 50% renewable energy target by 2030. We have also established the Advanced Queensland Future Jobs Strategy and the Innovation Partnership Program to send a clear signal uh, to industry about investment certainty in our state. In areas such as climate change, agriculture, clean energy, biotechnology and advanced manufacturing. The Queensland Government is also supporting innovation and market development in the land sector via the successful public-private partnership with Green Collar. In order to unlock biodiversity, conservation and reef protection, co-benefits through the Emissions Reduction Fund projects. There have already been some very successful outcomes for the partnership between EHP and Green Collar Group under the Catchment Conservation Alliance. The two bids to date for Southern Rivers and Great Barrier Reef initiatives have resulted in Green Collar contracting more than 20 million tonnes of abatement. The Green Barrier Reef Initiative, the Great Barrier Reef Initiative, I hope it gets back to green and red, and, um, contracted 15 million tonnes, the largest single contract ever in the ERF by a significant mar margin. It's a very, very um, um, good outcome, considering the previous largest contract was 3 million tonnes. Queensland, huge la uh, land sector, including blue carbon storage, for example, wetlands and mangroves, also present huge opportunities for local farmers and land managers, including traditional owners, 
uh, to produce high quality carbon sequestration with multiple environmental co-benefits. We want to see carbon markets deliver multiple environmental uh, objectives, including the protection of the Great Barrier Reef water uh, catchments. Together with Green Collar, we're looking to use innovative design and project structures to deliver significant environmental and social benefits beyond carbon. This can be achieved through the broad engagement with governments, research institutions, regional natural resources and management bodies, and the relevant industry organisations. The Great Barrier Reef. Earlier this year, disturbing research by Australia's foremost marine scientists revealed 93% of the Great Barrier Reef had been affected by coral bleaching. Worst, of course, the further north you got. Scientists have confirmed that coral bleaching is a phenomenon largely caused by warmer oceans uh, and by global carbon pollution. This is a climate change wake-up call and we need to focus on reducing as many pressures on the reef as possible. Reducing emissions and ensuring clean water for coral to thrive. As Minister Miles probably told you this morning, the Queensland Government has delivered on many of its commitments under the Reef 2050 Long-Term sustainable Sustainability Plan. Major achievements include committing $100 million over five years to water quality initiatives and research, introducing new ports legislation, the Sustainable Ports Development Act, establishing three net free fishing zones in Cairns, Mackay and Rockhampton, and establishing the Great Barrier Reef Water Science Task Force. Of course, the $7 million purchase of the Springvale uh, station in Cape York is the latest, most significant initiative announced by the Queensland Government. It was an opportunity that we had to take. This um, it was a h highly um, overworked uh, cattle station with lots of gully erosion, those sorts of things. It also had some areas of um, key habitat, so we took the opportunity to, to purchase it. We're working with Green Collar now to, um, to get abatement opportunities, but it was really, it contributes 40% of the suspended sediment that goes into the catchment at Cooktown, so that, for, for this one property. So it was, it was really, if we tried to take that out downstream by other means, it would have cost much, much more. But it was a manifestation of the quick responsiveness of the current government and, the, and my department. I was very proud of it. We, stitched up the deal in about two weeks. I think we're still informing some ministers about what we did, but most of the important <laughs> ones we told on the way. This is one move by the government where we kick goals for Queensland from improving water quality in the remote northern section of the reef, which has experienced the, the most coral bleaching, to protecting our biodiversity and growing the state's protected areas. Protected area acquisition. The acquisition of Springvale will contribute to the government's election commitment to increase the state's protected areas towards 17%. Through its Nature Assist programs, EHP identifies specific properties throughout Queensland which are likely to be resilient to climate change and then works with landholders with a view to establishing nature refuges to protect these areas. The program aims to protect our biodiversity by targeting actions to where they're most needed. <coughs> To date, there are 497 nature refuges located throughout the state from North Queensland to the Numanbar Valley. Innovation. Queensland Government is committed to driving sustainable development and there are some wonderful examples of innovation happening throughout the state. For example, a 16 million advanced biofuels pilot plant is being constructed at Southern Oils Refining Yarwin Plant in Gladstone a giant step towards securing a large-scale biofuels industry in Queensland. QUT's Biofuel Engine Research Facility is Australia's largest biofuel production testing facility, specialising in engine performance testing and biofuels emissions testing. And their research team is one of only a few in the world that specialise in the entire life cycle of biofuel production. So the impacts of climate change are real and the Queensland Government is serious about finding solutions to address the issue, which is one of the greatest threats to our economy, our environment and our culture. Queensland's embracing the challenge of climate change by looking at and implementing ways to change, <coughs> uh, looking at ways to switch our energy production to clean energy technologies and reduce our emissions. In closing, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today and sincerely congratulate Gecko 
for bringing us here together to share our ideas about tackling climate change. It's exactly the type of forum we need to have working together to build a cleaner, more sustainable and more prosperous Queensland. Thank you. I keep trying to speak into the light, but yeah. I'll, uh, there's some kind of metaphor there, but I'm missing it. Thank you very much, um, Jim. And now we have some time for questions, which is great. And I have been reminded that we must speak into microphones because it's being um, streamed, which sounds very technical. Okay, so we've got our roving mic here. Do we have some questions for Jim? Um, a gentleman here at the front. Yeah, hi, Jim. I heard you mention small-scale and large-scale renewable energy projects, but there's one which seems to be getting ignored, and I think that's probably through a lot of legislative changes might be required, is your medium scale. And I look around at massive, <coughs> excuse me, industrial areas with big, huge sheds that just acres and acres of um, photovoltaic you could be putting on those roofs and exporting all that. So what can you guys do to, to make it viable for owners to actually in, um, invest in that type of um, technology structure? Uh, thanks for the question. It, one of the things that we are looking at doing is all of the areas that we can locate, like we talk about, you talk about industrial estates with sheds, with roofs, flat roofs. There are also a lot of elevated structures. There are freeways. There are all sorts of areas where there is um, really good solar access. I was lucky enough to go to the um, COP conference in Paris with, with the minister and one of the things they were talking there amongst what they call the sub-national group, which were the provincial and state governments around the world, was, was that very fact, factor that there are lots of opportunities to put solar PV installations um, that have good solar access. We haven't got to it yet, but, it's, but it is something uh, that we're aware of and it's an opportunity we'd like to see how we can exploit down the track. Thank you, Jim. Do we have another question? Uh, Lise? Oh, microphone coming. Hi, I'm Lisa Coulter. I'm a PhD candidate at Griffith. Um, there's a lot of focus on mitigation. There's a lot of focus on climate change equals energy use. So uh, one of the things that happens in Queensland in particular is that we get people going into evacuation centres. Um, and that'll happen increasingly as we get severe weather events coming on. So I'm just wondering, do you have anything in your bag of discussion points that talks about increased risk from natural disasters, from climate change, and uh, how the province is looking, uh, the, the state's looking at managing things going forward to adapt? Um, I'm, not, I'm not really sort of Around full that. bottle. On, on it, but um, our area of um, fire and emergency services do do look do obviously have strategies in place for anything from you know wildfires through to to you know those processes of keeping communities safe, evacuation, um, those sorts of things. So it's not something that I could could say that I, I'm across, but I am with. <coughs> Police, emergency services, fire and emergency services, I do know that they do have sort of community um, community safety programs that they... That they it's just that those all deal with the climate that we have today. So I guess the question is, is there any connection with climate change and managing those things that well, you know of? Well, I guess the increasing evidence of high intensity weather events for example, you know, is uh, one of the manifestations of, of climate change. And uh, whether that's, you know, long, severe droughts or whether it's high intensity wind or tidal or those sorts of events and storms, I guess that's part of the sort of the future that we have to manage. But again, I'm not trying to pass it off. It's just, it's not something that's, that, that I could talk authoritatively about the strategies that are in place. 
Thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there was a, a lady in just there. <laughs> Sorry, I can hardly see you. Just with regard to that, Queensland has a disaster mitigation strategy, or it did about 20, 10 years ago. Newman might have thrown that out as well. Um, but the, the thing that I wanted to ask you about was the vegetation management. In the, what was it, mid-90s when we convinced, well, maybe it was 2000. Anyway, uh, the government was convinced to put in vegetation management in order to uh, combat climate change as a uh, um, carbon sink for Queensland to keep its vegetation. Uh, so now, though, that Newman Sini government threw out the Veg Management Act, basically, or destroyed it, now the, your government's trying to bring it back in, but you're, getting a, you're not able to do it because of the hung parliament or whatever. So I'm wondering, is there any talk at that level where they're trying to get the veg management uh, laws back in about the mitigation aspects of keeping our vegetation? Yeah. I, I think we've gone a long way to reintroducing um, the Veg Management Act. Um, it was one of those things, that, and um, I, again, am not full bottle, but I, I think we're pretty much back to where we were in terms of requirements for tree clearing permits. When I first um, arrived in November last year, the, watching the footage of D9 bulldozers, you know, with huge chains between them, uh, taking off in the morning and just driving up in North Queensland, so all that was stopped. It was stopped, and um, I think we've got the, um, pretty much under control, the tree clearing Back, back to the future again with our tree clearing legislation. Okay, we probably have time for one more quick question. I think there's a hand up the back there, gentleman with the maroon shirt. Oh, sorry, I can't, these lights are fabulous. Oh, Lois, Hi. can we go with him and then we'll, we'll go to Lois, great. All right, sorry, you probably can't see me up here. Um, Alice Tobacco, I'm a climate re reality leader, and I'm just um, mindful about your departmental portfolio, but I'd like to ask about the other departments and other areas um, uh, of government. For example, um, the, big, the big ones, health and education, transport and, and water and energy, and the commitments that are made there. And I guess that, um, with, with all respect, um, and I, I, I much applaud what is going on in terms of funding commitments. When you look at the amount of the, um, the, uh, money that we look at at something like the tunnel in, in Brisbane, compared to the amount that's being spent on something like climate change, um, it's still very small bickies and it's still, to my mind, not being uh, driven in those other departments. So maybe you could um, allay my fears and see that the other departments are actually building it into those major budgets. Um, uh, I, I can't, uh, I can't say that, that, you know, health or transport or other departments are looking at climate change initiatives. I guess we've got, um, the monkey firmly on our back, um, and, uh, one of the things I can say is that it's, uh, it's a very, very, uh, competitive process to get uh, your share of the budget. Um, so I'd imagine that a lot of those other jurisdictions would be focusing on their core business. And, um, but I think we can work across departments. Um, for example, primary industries, um, mines and resources we're working closely with around, you know, to make sure that we're we're having an influence, not just in terms of environmental management, but also in terms of, of climate change. But um, yeah, it's a bit of a, uh, those of you who have worked in the state government or what have you, you at, at, um, at, at, at budget time, you're really there trying to make sure you get your, your share of the cake. Um. Thank you, Jim. And uh, the final question is our fabulous gecko leader, Lois. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Jim, for your uh, presentation. It's very interesting. I'm interested in the nature reserves and uh, I commend the government for what they're trying to do in terms of uh, increasing the protected estate. But I am concerned that nature 
uh, refuges are not protected from mining. And I'm wondering if the department or the government generally are doing anything to prevent these precious areas that we're going to need for climate change um, resilience and, and adaptation uh, to protect them better. And I guess the, the classic example is the nature refuge uh, that's threatened by the Adani mine. Uh, but all nature refuges can be threatened by mining and, and other economic development. So how is the government looking at uh, protecting them better? Um, you know, I can be uh, honest in this room. Uh, <laughs> uh, mining is omnipresent and, you know, there are rights that miners have that, that other tenure holders, and, you know, do not have. Uh, we work, you know, our, our, our intersection with mining, my department, is mainly around uh, rehabilitation of mine sites and, and it's very unsatisfactory, that sort of process, getting money out of mines to, to, to have either um, continu continuous remediation or remediation afterwards. So I, I can say nothing more than I, it, it's, it's not something that, that I think is on the government's agenda to change the sort of nature with mining. It's, you know, it, is, um, it is what it is. Uh, and our, our objectives are, as I say, the environmental impacts of mining that we're trying to manage. But it's, again, it's, it's really tough. And at the moment, we're getting um, the keys left under the mat um, of all these mines that uh, uh, the previous owners have just walked off. And so we have to get boots on the ground down at Texas Silver to make sure we're managing, you know, tailings dams so that downstream communities water sources aren't. And we're, we're the only person in the, in the sort of, in the ring there doing that sort of stuff. It falls to us. So it's nothing, it's not something that I'm satisfied about, but I, um, um, and I'm always advocating uh, for stronger financial assurance and guarantees for mining companies, but it's not something that, you know, uh, is, is happening quickly or to my, from my point of view, satisfactorily. Okay. Right. Yeah. Oh. We'll be kept inside, I know that. Oh, sure, sure. Jim's not happy. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Jim. Um, we appreciate your time here today, and I think if we can just wrap up our session by showing Jim our appreciation of your time today. <laughs> and be before you disappear up the stairs, Jim, I believe one of our lovely volunteers has a gift. Fantastic. Should I be explaining what the gift is? Was that done this morning? It's a boomerang bag, oh, and brilliant. it's made by a local social enterprise. You can tell I it was. I know. I've got a submission on my desk. Awesome! <laughs> wow. Well, we're not sure if you can receive that now. It might be seen as a bribe. Excellent. Thank you. Now I know what the product is. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, I seem to have very carefully written down the, the next session and then lost the note. So that's awesome of me. Um, very strange. I would now like to introduce the urban space team. That makes them sound like astronauts, I know. <laughs> um, look, it's lovely because I was told that these guys were originally going to do one paper or one talk, but they are cheerful urban mutineers and they have decided to do a talk together and more revolutionarily, they're actually running a workshop together. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce um, our panel on theme five, which is around urban space and places, and our three lovely speakers. We've got um, Jason Byrne from the School of, I'm doing all this from memory, your School of Environment from Griffith University, Dan Ware from Coastal Management within Griffith University, and this lovely gentleman, Ned Wales, Ned, Ned Wales from Bond University. I knew all that, and I shall now find my notes as you come up and give your lovely talk. Now, just in terms of, I think you guys have a lovely panel discussion, and then we're going to break out into the workshop groups, but I will come back and give you more instructions once I find my notes. Lovely, thank you. Over to these guys, big clap, clapping. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Well, welcome. Uh, gee, it's wonderful to have so many people in attendance today on some very, very crucial issues. And so I welcome you from far and close by. 
and I'm so pleased to be working with my colleagues from various uh, organisations around the Gold Coast. Um, gee, it's looking so formal, well done. Uh, clicker, excellent. All right, so uh, what I want to do today is uh, get my clicker to work. <laughs> Let's see, uh, is that right? Is it, where is it hiding? Any idea, any tech savvy people here? Uh, I'm assuming it's the button that moves forward. I could probably just. <laughs> so what I want to talk about today <coughs> is, and particularly with my colleagues, we've met a couple of times to sort of re regroup and try to energise our particular session here um, today because we're very conscious of that being a community-based activity. Uh, so our uh, workshop session is going to be quite important. And we've moved our workshop, workshop session to G31, which is the planning school. Uh, we will have people who will be directing you in that, right, uh, in that direction, and of course my colleagues will be accompanying you over there. The point of that is that we want to get you in one room around tables, actually workshopping some of the processes uh, of which we have concern about. <coughs> One of the things that we've noticed as uh, Gold Coast residents is a certain lack of planning from our local government agencies. Uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, which of course is many, you know, it's quite obvious to many people who follow politics in this part of the world. So one of the things that we want to achieve today is some actions that are going to start driving from the grassroots approach upwards. Um, now, as our esteemed colleagues have mentioned earlier this morning, our politics are what they are. They are generally our uh, elected officials are the middle demographic. They're generally the person, thank you very much, Jason. They're generally the person that um, is sort of, you know, I usually take Dawn Critchlow as a, a classic example. If you're familiar with Dawn, she's in her 70s. She represents Southport. Uh, she has a certain agenda in terms of her politics. And she's representative of that population. And of course, we have what we have because that representation is being elected on uh, de democratic principles. However, I am a believer of the democratic system and we can enact change here. We, we are the people. We have the capability of shifting the direction of what's going on here. And of course, uh, as we're hearing much about this morning, we are lagging behind uh, rather grossly. Um, what I'm briefly, very briefly going to talk about because we are getting shorter and shorter on time is that humans are very resilient uh, people. If you look back in terms of time of history, uh, we have regrouped and reorganised ourselves um, around certain ideologies and certainly around economic development and economic benefit. Knowledge is part of that and certainly when we look at the history of the knowledge of mankind, we can look back to the Alexandrian Library, for example, which was um, initially established as sort of the, uh, the depository of all knowledge uh, within the Western world. And then, of course, it was burnt to the ground uh, by some rather radical rebels uh, in about 500 uh, BC. At which point, of course, we very quickly slipped into medieval dark age uh, type mentalities where society was pretty much on the lowdown for the next five to 600 years. And that's not new. There are many, many societies that have made mistakes and fallen over. And of course, this is the benefit that we have with our technology and our advancements in uh, education and knowledge is that we can hopefully learn from the mistakes of prior generations and prior societies um, and avoid the calamity that uh, Hollywood loves to present in terms of uh, the dire sorts of outcomes. And of course what we often talk about are mitigation, adaption and resilience. Some fairly sophisticated words which um, try to sort of uh, clarify the various approaches to the, uh, the emergency, the environmental emergency that uh, we're upon. And of course we're witnessing on a regular basis the impacts of those changes. And in a very piecemeal, certainly my own personal observation from a piecemeal approach, we are trying to address it bit by bit. But we haven't seen this major shift to this point. And of course we are all becoming more and more aware of the importance of that, not just because people are actually dying as a consequence of climate change, but because it's having a deeper impact on, us, uh, on, a, on a much gr greater level. So yes, you can appear frustrated at the federal level and certainly uh, the state appears to be making some sort of um, 
uh, action towards improving the situation, but for the most part, it's very reliant on local governments. And if you're a follower of uh, certainly federation in Australia and the state governments, of course, the state governments were colo colonies originally, reorganised under a federation um, sort of arrangement. Uh, that was all about the geography of Australia and the, uh, the tyranny of distances and so forth. If you look at states today, the state government is actually an obsolete type of institution. We need to be moving fairly rapidly towards this environmental regional based approach. So, you know, the political revolutionary in me is making a suggestion that hopefully within my lifetime I'll make that, I'll see that change. Because the policy direction and the policy approach that we have at the moment is quite clumsy and not really, in my eyes, certainly in the Australian context, not necessarily moving as rapidly as it should in terms of addressing some of these issues. And of course we are highly vulnerable here on the coast. I think the Gold Coast and Cairns are considered some of the most vulnerable places in Australia in terms of um, uh, climate change overall. So if we begin to reassess our political boundaries, and hopefully at some point that that will happen, we can certainly end up with uh, this idea of catchments, a political boundary around a catchment, and overall greater levels of control in terms of our environmental outcome and uh, the benefit of the biosphere overall. Um, of course, when we talk about adaption and mitigation, we see overlaps. Uh, we've heard a bit about that today, the importance of how those two uh, circles interact. Um, there is probably a bit of a debate in terms of d adaption. I suppose many of us are uh, still struggling with that. And certainly mitigation in terms of the advancement of the technology, the ability to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere by 2050 is the prediction that there is some hope in terms of trying to turn this uh, Titanic around. Um, but in the meantime, uh, like many of these people in the room, I'm sure I'm becoming a little impatient with what's happening at the political level and certainly at the local political level. And uh, so I'm now going to be passing it on to my colleagues to explain in a little more detail how our communities can actually be redeveloped and redesigned uh, in light of some of the changes uh, that are coming about in the near future. Awesome. Thanks very much, Ned. So um, I have a confession to make. Um, I'm a planner and uh, we're uh, probably quite a misunderstood profession. But um, I'm sure you can all share my sadness um, when I look at uh, this document up here on the screen. So the document up here on the screen was, was our previous plan about climate change. It's the, uh, the Gold Coast it's actually a strategy rather than a plan, but you know, same, same. So this one, it died and the problem's not solved yet. So I think in commiserating that fact, I wrote a poem. <laughs> this is my first poem. <laughs> See, <laughs> climate change requires both individual and collective action, yet our government is missing in action. See, it rhymes. <laughs> Which is much to our dissatisfaction, so while, we each act as individuals, what opportunities exist for collective action? So that's my question. And so when I, when I talk about collective action, I'm not necessarily talking about the collective action that we undertake to protest an issue. And whilst this is really important in shaping the politics, the collective action I'm talking about oh, is more like this form of collective action. So I think it's time that we stop waiting uh, for Gold Coast City Council to lead us around climate change. You have to wait, come on. I wrote a poem. I think it's time that we, we undertake a community-based climate planning exercise. And by planning, I don't think planning is important in that we have a plan and we know where we're going. So it's not like the IKEA approach to home furnishings. Planning is a, is a shared experience that we can participate in as a community where we share ideals and we undertake a deliberative process to reach a sense of agreement about where we're headed as a community, what are our shared values and shared interests and what do we want to do as a community together. Because while there's a whole lot of things that we can do as individuals and whilst we can all go out and buy a Prius tomorrow, you know, that's not going to deal with the energy challenge that we face while we continue to, to live in this really distributed form of, of cities. And equally, whilst we can all uh, improve the design of our house, insulate our roofs, we're still not going to deal with rising sea levels in that way. So a lot of the challenges around climate change are really about collective challenges 
And generally our collective challenges have been dealt with by governments, but our government is failing us in this situation. And it doesn't mean that we've got to stand here and wait for our government to act. There's really simple frameworks around how communities can come together and undertake a planning exercise, and these are kind of well accepted, and I'm not going to go into them now because of time, but we'll talk about this in the workshop. The main question is, do we want to bring this entity with us in doing this exercise? There's some benefits in bringing this entity with us in undertaking this exercise. This is the red dot entity here. <laughs> but the key thing about a plan is that a plan needs legitimacy. And by bringing this entity with us, it would give us a sense of legitimacy to create this plan and to have this plan and to implement this plan. So there's some value in bringing this entity with us, but equally I don't think we need to wait for this entity to do something. So I don't think it's a necessary precondition that this entity leads any form of community-based uh, climate plan. So there's a whole range of ways that we can shape the politics about that, and this is one of the ways that we can shape the politics about it. But the key thing that we really need to do to shape the politics is much more about this. It's much more about the discussions that we have with our neighbours, because it's not an issue of trying to convince politicians, it's really an issue of trying to convince our neighbours about this, because the politicians will list, listen to what the people say. And we can do that far more readily in a picnic than we can do it but through the end of a loudspeaker. Why do I know this is true? Well, I've had this experience before. So it's not a climate change experience, it's a surfing experience. And I was recently accused of having a conflict of interest for writing a paper about the Gold Coast Surf Management Plan. The reason I had a conflict of interest is because I'm a surfer, which was a strange one for me, but it's the first time, so I'll disclose that, I'm a surfer. <laughs> you can see me at the top of that picture. So that was in December of 2012. Um, in that year, a surfer was killed at Kurumban Alley. Um, he was hit by a boat while he was paddling out in the creek. Um, it was on Mother's Day. He was a father. He had two children. And when the Queensland State Government investigated that incident, they found, and they actually recommended, that what was needed here was for surfers to be classified under the Marine Safety Act and for surfers to actually be classified as vessels because then they'd have an obligation to yield to other vessels crossing that bar, which I found preposterous at the time. I spoke to a number of people about it, but no one could find anything to do about it. And so my suggestion was what we needed was we needed to create an institution to deal with these issues, because there was an institution missing in action here. And I, I suggested this idea of a surf management plan. In 2015, the Gold Coast City Council released a surf management plan after three years of work. And that was a community-led activity. That wasn't, a, wasn't Tom Tate's realisation. That was something that we did as a group, as a community. So I think there is great scope here for us as a community to lead uh, Gold Coast City Council on this issue of climate, and that's, that's our idea. So I'd like to hand over to Jason to talk about the actual nuts and bolts of how that might happen. Thank you, everybody. Um, the danger of going last is that you, you have hardly any time left, but luckily I'm good at speaking very quickly. Um, so what I want to do is just quickly remind us about the focus here. We're not talking about burning down the Alexander Library, but what we are talking about is hacking planning ourselves. As a planner myself, I get just as frustrated as you are. Um, so we're suggesting the important thing is for us to offer an alternative model to design our own plan and offer that up instead. All right, so here's a quick reminder about the kind of issues we're dealing with. These are happening today, right? We're living in climate change. This is not something in the distant future. This is happening right now. These are the people who are affected. They're the people who are right next door to you. They're also the marginalised and vulnerable communities that we have around us. People who are homeless, people who are immigrants, people who are elderly, disabled, very young, those prone to heat waves, those who are diseased, those in hospital, those who are unemployed. The latest climate modelling is really, really scary. Paul Beckwith uh, has been uh, live tweeting that we're very, very close to blowing uh, um, um, uh, margin of comfort here. If we look at the Analog Cities uh, website from the CSIRO, we can see under worst case scenarios and best case scenarios what the Gold Coast is going to look like in the future, in roughly 2050. We can go through to 2090. What we see here is it's actually not that different to what it is today. That's the good news in terms of temperature and precipitation regimes. So maybe up to 12% uh, less rainfall, maybe up to two to four degrees hotter, um, but not that different to today. 
When we look at flooding though, if we go to coastalrisk.com.au and we look at flooding, this is under best case scenario, one metre sea level rise, won't be happening by 2100, looks like middle of the century uh, under current um, emissions regimes. So this is not bad, but this is a four metre sea level rise, which is what we will be seeing in the future on the Gold Coast. So if you have property on the coastal plain, now it's time to start reimagining what that might look like. I'm imagining excellent artificial surfing reefs, for example. I'm a surfer as well, so surfing over apartment buildings has a kind of um, <laughs> sick, twisted fascination for me. Um, but we need to be thinking about this in a creative way, right? How can we take this kind of message of apocalypse and turn it into something that's, um, that's more reassuring and something that we can cope with as humans? We like to know messages of hope. So some excellent dive sites here in future. We have a fabulous dive industry. Being able to, we, don't, we don't need to wait for a, a Navy boat. We'll be able to go through apartment buildings. All right, and really it comes down to looking at the physical uh, dimensions of vulnerability. These are things like height above sea level or the kind of um, built form that you have, whether it's too dense and traps heat or is prone to uh, cyclones, and the social dimensions of vulnerability, for, and some of those I mentioned already before. So being indigenous, being disabled, uh, having a large family with children, single parent, parent, these kind of things. Planning's not doing the right thing. It's not really addressing these dimensions of vulnerability. You know, transit-oriented developments and solar panels aren't really going to cut it. On the Gold Coast, what we need to be thinking about is who's vulnerable and what might be done. So working families on flood-prone land, people who are caravan park dwellers, um, clusters of poverty amidst wealth, these kind of issues. And then what actions might we take? I don't want to preempt everybody in this room. We're going to talk about this in the panel shortly in our workshop. But could we envisage, for example, the coastal plain going back to one large swamp like it used to be? Is there an opportunity for new mangrove forests as a form of mitigation and adaptation on the coastal plain? For you, what I want you to be thinking about as we move up to uh, our workshop for those who will be joining us is we do have some of these off-the-shelf solutions already. So food security, maybe community gardens or urban agriculture. Heat wave response, maybe forming networks where you check on your neighbours during uh, heat waves. Um, painting your roof white, right, instead of these charcoal grey and black roofs. So there's some very easy kind of solutions that we, we could be thinking about. And then some of the more kind of off-the-shelf responses, maybe public art, let's celebrate our coastal plain getting inundated. Um, large rubber duckies, for example. or um, Poo is an incredible resource. Humans are full of it. <laughs> Planners get often told we're full of poo. Um, humans are full of it. We could harness that stuff for biogas. We could be, in fact, decentralising our energy production to our backyards, harnessing uh, methane, using that for electricity generation, using it for, uh, for cooking. And then finally, uh, we might become activists ourselves. Who's to say we don't do a little bit of... Uh, handy paint work on some of these signs that are around that show us where the flood levels are from the 1974 floods and just convert it to sea level, right? Help people in the community understand the kind of issues that we're facing. So we'll open up for questions. Thank you so much, guys. And I think we probably have time for maybe just one or two quick questions, and then I know that we can then break into workshops and folks who have got burning issues to chat can follow you and the amazing pink paddle that I'm about to describe um, off into a planning discussion. So do we have burning questions for our amazing planning team? Uh, gentleman over here. Oh, now I see him. <laughs> Why are we not surprised? It's Steve again. Um, uh, love the idea of... Um, having a democracy. Socrates says that democracy only works when the public are informed and knowledgeable, but when they're being fed misinformation, wrong facts, lies and spin, it's very difficult to uh, actually believe that we're living in a democracy. Given that you're doing critical analysis, uh, research, how does the academy communicate their analysis and research to the policy makers, to the public and to the government decision makers. Um, of course, uh, community groups have social media and other forms now that have come to the fore. What strategies do you use to get this important information and these sorts of questions and answers out to those decision makers? Yeah. Start with that. Um, I, I think the whole issue around certainly lo local politics, and we can probably talk more about uh, state and federal, 
is there's so much smoke and mirrors about how you as an individual enact or assert your power within the political regime of uh, the Gold Coast, which is a very large organisation, it's over 3,000 people uh, working in the Gold Coast. And there are some very, very good people within the council and, um, you know, that has to be remembered. There's some really very um, passionate, committed people within Gold Coast City Council. However, I think there is this sort of misunderstanding, well, first of all, the Gold Coast, the nature of the Gold Coast, very transient uh, location. I, you know, we could probably have a show of hands of who was here in 1974 for the last flood, for example, or in 1966 during the last big cyclone event and sort of witness some of these major catastrophes on the coast. And that's probably not many people in the room, I would say, uh, certainly if you're local on the Gold Coast. So we have a very transient population and this was really seen in the futures, the Bold Future program where very few people would show up to um, the community consultation process. We've also got a generation of people who are very engaged and very, very busy. Uh, there's this preoccupation with a two household income or if you're a sole parent, just trying to uh, pay the bills and it's, very, it's becoming more and more difficult to have the time to really engage and I think that's a, a, another major barrier. But in terms of more directly in answering your question, I think it has a lot to do with lobbying uh, politicians and making sure that the politicians are supportive and understand the rationale behind what we're doing. Of course, with our political system the way it's run at the moment, which is a uh, geographical based allocation, and we've got, I think, what, 14 councillors on council, we've got a spread of 14 councillors competing against each other because of the thiefdom approach rather than a broader based political uh, ideology on which they're being elected on. And that, that's a, a big issue, uh, I think, overall. Um, and then, of course, making sure, and with, on those short um, uh, election cycles of three to four years, is ensuring that you are uh, lobbying in a way that uh, is gaining more broader support from your community, participation, um, uh, various participation organisation and activist type uh, activity does get uh, wording. You cannot expect our directors and our senior management at the local government level to really take action. Having experience from the inside in the past, uh, running the environmental planning um, and management program at Gold Coast City Council, I was constantly being called on the carpet uh, for, to dumb down the whole environmental agenda or to make sure that I would appease the elected officials, whatever it might be. So it's very difficult as a senior operator within the Gold Coast context because you're not supported to be innovative or to be to work outside the uh, the mantra or the values of the organisation, which is very dominated by the politicians. And another thing I think is perhaps a little dangerous within the Gold Coast context is that politicians have a lot of direct input into the leadership. So you will get, and I often did as as a senior manager, get direct phone calls, which is not actually allowable within Queensland law, but it's not the way it works. Uh, telling me to back off on a particular development or a particular situation. So Gold Coast has got a lot of problems and I think this is why I've been very supportive of Dan's approach because we actually have to do it from the community up. It's not going to happen from the top down, unfortunately. Right, so we're right on time and I'm not going to take any longer, but we work with them is the short answer. We do, we do uh, consultancy work with the Gold Coast City Council. We're working on these plans and the stuff that we're going to do this afternoon will feed feed straight back to council, so you can help us make the plan. Right, so you've beat me to it, you've actually given these guys some lovely applause. I was about to say let's give it up and say thank you to our panellists. And um, so apparently now what's going to happen is instead of five workshops, we're getting a wonderfully condensed version. So we're going to actually break now for three workshops. Each of the workshops will go for 50 minutes. And just to recap, the workshops are, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, workshop number one, two, and three will be brought together. So that's Ned, Jason, and Dan. And they are going to have a volunteer with an amazing pink paddle. So if you got, there's the there's volunteer now showing you his amazing pink fish. I actually thought it said pink poodle, which I thought would have been quite cute, but very strange. So if you're interested in that workshop, please do follow these lads and also your pink poodle. Um, and we've also got two other workshops. Um, the Redland City Councillor Paul Bishop will be leading a group that are gonna have a blue paddle, I imagine.
Awesome, thanks, that sounds great. And our purple, or theme number three, um, oh, it's also theme three, but it's workshop five. Oh God, forget the numbers. Um, there's a, the wonderful Mayor Simon Richardson from Byron Shire, and Shire Council is here. Yes, sorry mate, we can't see with the lights. Um, yay! So if you would now like to break, and just before you do, we're all gonna go from the workshops and then have afternoon tea at about 2.40, and then we'll all meet back in here around three o'clock. And then each of the workshops from this afternoon and from this morning, we'll have a little mini report back in our final session this afternoon. So I think that's all under control and you have to allocate one person to talk about one action. Um, and we'll also be looking at the work of the actioneers. Lots of exciting things to come back for after afternoon tea. So go forth and find your pink poodle or blue poodle. Thank you.